Hi. Is it working? Hi, I'm Miff and this is Sarah. We are both donor conceived, created by science under ethically bankrupt guarantees of anonymity for the sperm donors. We note that despite decades of profiteering in the global trade in sperm, eggs, embryo and wombs, this is the first time the United Nations is hearing from a group of the human beings created by these practices. All of us have paid our own way to come here as private individuals and we're glad to be here. But we should have had a voice and your attention right from the start. Whilst my biological father's file from 1977 was miraculously preserved, I was denied access to it. I was prepared to tell my story, which appeared with my photo on the front page of a national newspaper, and as a result, he contacted me. The medical records of my conception were deliberately destroyed by one of Australia's largest public hospitals, along with the records of at least 80, but possibly hundreds of others. No one has been held to account. If the people conceived using donor conception and surrogacy want to know their biological and birth families, and we know that they do, as is their right, then we must inquire, what is the justification for denying a child, a human being, the right to their own identity and ethnicity, the right to know and have contact with their biological family members? In the clash between the desires of prospective parents, the fertility industry and our human rights, as we have heard here today, it is rare that our rights and interests prevail. There is no right to have a child under international law. Children are not goods or services that the state or business can guarantee or provide. They are human beings themselves with rights. The UN Special Rapporteur on the Sale of Children stated last year that commercial surrogacy usually results in the sale of children. Well, it's not just commercial surrogacy. You have heard here today from donor-conceived people who were bought and sold. And we would like to acknowledge the donor conceived people who should be here with us today, but due to these systems and practices, have already lost their lives. So when we are considering donor conception and surrogacy, we must be starting from the position that these practices are not in the best interests of children, where we know that if someone is conceived in this manner, their rights, as stated under the Convention, will be at the very least impacted, if not negated entirely. Sarah, are there any, ever, so any, any circumstances in which donor conception and surrogacy can be allowed? We believe this can only happen if it is legislated like open adoption. G's ability to know her family is lucky. It is not hers by legal right. For donor conception and surrogacy to be ethical, all children must have a legal right to know their biological parents, all of their biological siblings, and also their birth mother, whether or not she is also a biological parent. They have a right to know that none of those parties were paid, compensated, or otherwise rewarded. This is non-negotiable. There is no jurisdiction in the world which currently upholds and protects these rights. Consequently, we say that wherever in the world a state allows donor conception and surrogacy today, it is unethical. It should be strictly regulated akin to an open adoption or it should come to a halt. Further, it is galling to know that principles, guidelines and legislation are often drafted by people who know so little about our lived experiences. You would never make Indigenous policy without consulting Indigenous people. It is fundamentally offensive to think that many who sit here today and elsewhere do not take a strong stance to prohibit commercial practices that commodify and dehumanise us. And not only us, as the nature of these transactions often also involve disadvantaged gamete donors or surrogate mothers who are also trafficked. Children have a right to know their biological parents and siblings and to seek contact with them, not through detective work when they're adults, but right from the start. Anything less than this serves doctors, commissioning parents, big business, everyone but the child. Children also have a right to expect that by law, if they are created from third party gametes, they will have no more than 10 biological siblings, and ideally much less. 
and that they will know who each and every one of those siblings are. Governments must enshrine the biological origins of their citizens in birth certificates, the one document that parents cannot conceal or alter. The international community has a duty to prevent cross-border gamete trafficking, the exploitation and commodification of children, baby factories, and to encourage national governments to uphold their own laws. Finally, the medical profession should go back to first principles. First, do no harm. They must put the rights of the child first, and they have a duty to tell all adults the most important truth about fertility instead of pushing them into fertility treatment. If you want to have a child, you need to start as early as possible. Only then can you give yourself the best chance of avoiding the vortex of IVF, third-party material, surrogacy, lies and exploitation. Of course, the heartbreak of wanting a child is something I think we can all empathise with. However, however, supporting and allowing this international commercial exploitative industry to grow unheeded is at best misguided. Expensive, quite often harmful and ineffective fertility treatments are not the solution. Every child has the right under the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, which we celebrate here today, to identity, to family, including biological family, and to not be bought or sold. Every child has the right to be heard. We are the products of this industry and we have not been heard or respected. If we are included at all, it is as an afterthought, a tick the box exercise so that governments and businesses can progress with their documents and their proposals. But we are the voices of the surrogacy and donor conceived people we're now grown and our voices are stronger. We know what is in our best interests and what is not, and we hope you're listening. Please come and find and speak to us afterwards about all these things. We would love to talk to you. My name is Anne Skelton, and I'm here to moderate this before I get into the panel, I think you'll all agree with me that that was extraordinary. 